Elizabeth Warren promises that her Secretary of Education will be vetted by a trans child. Well, I guess that's still better than leaving the choice to a lying, hypocritical, fake Indian who talks like a Bolshevik while living the life of a privileged one percenter. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and screw you, Liz Warren. This is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness and ca- impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we're discussing a new study that's not all surprising. It shows that college professors donate to Democratic candidates 95 to 1. That's actually probably a lot higher than that. Plus, a Georgetown lawyer says biology should be ignored when addressing whether biological men should be allowed to complete, compete in women's sports. But we start with Senator Elizabeth Warren and her promise to nominate a secretary of education who has the approval of a transgender sh- a child. What Warren is talking about, where this question was actually given to her, was at a Cedar Rapids, Iowa town hall event. Let the pandering begin. We need a secretary of education who believes in public education. <laughs> I have two qualifications that I've talked about over and over for my Secretary of Education. The first, it has to be someone who's taught in a public school. Hello? And part two, because it came from a young trans person who asked about a welcoming community, and I said it starts with a secretary of education who has a lot to do with where we spend our money, with what gets advanced in our public schools, with what the standards are. And I said, I'm going to have a secretary of education that this young trans person interviews on my behalf. And only if this person believes that our secretary or secretary of education nominee is someone who is committed to creating a welcoming environment, a safe environment, and a full educational curriculum for everyone, will that person actually be advanced to be Secretary of Education? God, she's an idiot. So by your logic, Liz, we should have only presidents of the United States, the only people who should be qualified for president are people who've managed and run big economies. You have it, right? If we were going to play your game, right, that you can't be a secretary of education unless you taught in one of these nasty little public school classrooms, let's do it with you. What are your qualifications? What, how, what, what sympathy do you have for the military? What experience do you have, Liz, as a commander in chief? And the answer is none. What experience do you have with economies other than undermining them with leftist economics? You have none. What qualifies? If you're going to play that game, Liz, let's play the identity game. You tried to be an Indian but we're bad at it, right? Because you had no Indian blood. You are a liar and a hypocrite. Let's just apply to you the same standard you're going to apply, the same litmus test you're going to apply for the Secretary of Education. And Elizabeth Warren specifically, when she says that, and I like how she had to pause when she didn't know how to properly say a trans person Mm -hmm. because she's pandering and trying to remember her script. But she was referencing someone named Jacob, a nine-year-old girl who identifies as Jacob. And this event had happened back in October. And she had applauded saying, yay, good for you for coming out as trans. So by her logic then too, if the Secretary of Ed needs to be vetted by Jacob, the nine-year-old, you can basically be assured that the next school year, everyone will be watching SpongeBob SquarePants during you know, history class, and or maybe it would be science. And then for lunch, they would have a new lunch program that would just be ice cream and, I don't know, unicorn popcorn or something. Because this is what Liz Warren is doing. Her pandering has nothing at all, obviously, to do with qualifications for a Secretary of Ed. It's all about getting that trans identity. Agenda. Yeah, yeah and, and identity. she keeps talking about a, a fully inclusive. <laughs> yeah. you, you're going to have basically a fully inclusive curriculum 
for every different kind of person. You've got, what, at least anywhere between 76 and 150 gen transgenders, right? Well, I'm sure the vapo gender and the mirror gender need radically different things. If you believe that gender is smoke and goes away, like vapo genders do, and mirror genders, you believe that whenever you see somebody, you adopt you their that. gender, you need radically different con uh, 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 curricula. This idea that you're gonna do, and then, then what are you gonna do with straight black men? Oh. And what are you gonna do with uh, uh, gay Latinos? Ooh. And what are you gonna do with the lesbian Vietnamese? This is just ridiculous, right? You're trying to take public schools, which by their definitions, as weak as they have been, cater to the broadest aspect of what we are, right? Because you can't tailor these things. Every classroom, every lesson, every book is gonna have to change from day to day. It, if this were anything more than pandering, and she anything more than a shill, I suppose it would be worth getting more aggravated about. But the sad thing is, is that this is what a Bernie Sanders presidency will look like, or a, a what did Biden say about transgenders the other day? Oh, they, this is the civil rights issue of, of our, our time. time, right? Forget homelessness, forget feces in San Francisco, no. forget what was, what's going on with our destroyed veterans when they get home, forget all of that now, right? And let's cater, let's cater to this made up problem. Let's start targeting kids as young as three and four and drive it into their heads that gender is malleable and then now you get nine year olds telling the president of the United States how they should hire for the Secretary of Education. It's unbelievable how the adults, the so-called adults, progressive adults of the Democrat Party, don't want to do any original thinking. They want the kids to do it. Absolutely. When it comes to whether it's climate change or gender, <laughs> let's make sure the kids are the ones who tell us what we should do. They are the human shields. So we know that before Liz Warren went on to be Focahontas, she was a Harvard Law School professor. Is that not what she was that's well because, she was, no, she, was a, you know. she, she was a pretend native american oh, affirmative action uh, harvard <laughs> law, law i teacher. thought i was forgetting something there yeah. um well it's not surprising that she's a member of the democrat party and a professor because we learned that professors and this is not shocking in the least they donate to the democrats over the republicans at a ratio of 95 to 1 meaning that for every time they donate to one republican 95 Democrats <laughs> and, are getting that money instead. And let me tell you why it's much worse than that. Because let, ask yourself this. You've got the Democrats, Republicans, and then you've got the progressives, mm -hmm. right? And libertarians. All Democrats supporting college professors donate to Democrats. But the radical liberals, right, the progressives, still donate to Democrats because there aren't really any viable progressive candidates, right? So in other words, if you look at where the money of non-Republican professors goes, you will see that much, I bet you that's like 150 to one. Because you think about, or people who don't, or, or again, progressive Democrat, or progressive professors who don't give money to Democrats because they're not liberal enough, right? They don't, they may not donate at all. So my point is, is that when you factor in all the possibilities politically of, pro of professors besides simply Democrats, you will find that that number has to be much higher. True. And in the, for this specific study, it was by uh, Heterodox Academy Director of Research, Sean Stevens, and Brooklyn College Professor Mitchell Langbert. So they took a look at there were uh, just over 2,000 professors who donated any money, and 2,081 donated to the Democrats. The Republicans got donated to 22. 20. Two. That's not even two dozen. That's, whew. but then there, there was a whole nine, nine professors out of the 2,112 professors who donated any money who decided, you know what, I'm going to donate to both. So at least we got nine people. And I love That's this. That's just N insane to me. Nearly half of the 12,372 professors, 48.5%, are reg registered Democrats, while just 5.7 are Republicans. Now, so 48.5% per of those 12,000 are registered Democrats, 57 registered Republicans. Go back to my initial point. Mm -hmm. How many of those? Uh, uh, if you if you tripled that number, how many of the professoriate don't identify with Democrats because they're not left wing enough? I guarantee you, there are almost none who don't identify yep. Republicans because with the Republican Party because they're not right wing enough. Yeah. So this is interesting since you know you're a professor in in an English department, um, you're more likely to be a registered Democrat if you are a Northeast. So the northeast part of the country, woman in the English anthropology or sociology departments. Have you had any run-ins with a woman 
in the English department who came from a northeastern state. My, I haven't spoken much about this publicly. I won't bore you through it here. But you, you get some of these women. They become per, 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 uh, chairs, particularly of English departments, history departments. And I tell you, they – the the level of politics at which they descri- they destroy you. I mean, this is not a, a group of live and let live people. These are people who you either agree with us politically or they're going to find ways to undermine you. But it's it's bad all across the disciplines. I mean, this is a staggering number. And, and here's the thing: I keep hearing from my university colleagues for the last 25 years that whenever you have these kinds of disparities, right, this kind of ideological disparity, that shows by definition prejudice unless the numbers skew progressive. At which Mm. point then, well, that's not this kind of intellectual and institutional bias. This isn't dangerous. And we're actually, because we're progressives, we're much more fair-minded. Oh, yes. Right? We, We don't push our progressivism on our students. Which, if you think about it then, all the, if you look back at, at every single show we've done, and you talk about the stories that happen on the college campuses, when they're saying it's a ratio of 8.5 registered Democrats to one registered Republican, and we're having all the issues on these college campuses, it's the same argument of, oh, our cities are so bad. Well, who runs them? Democrats. That's right. It's the same argument. And if, yet... If, if universities <laughs> are all about rape culture, who oversees who rape good? culture? They do. If our yeah. universities can't teach kids reading and writing, who runs the university? And ask yourself this, if with these kinds of disparities, what do you think that means for the guest speakers invited to campus? What do you think that means for where money goes in terms of what kind of programming? What do you think it means, right? Uh, It means every aspect of the university is tainted by this. And again, just ask yourself, if this was Coca-Cola and this was the ratio of every Coca-Cola executive president, uh, executive class person, they would be screaming. You'd have Jesse Jackson shaking them down for reparations. But because it's progressive, and I hear this from my my professor colleagues all the time, well, we're so progressive and smart that we don't use our bias. Everybody in my class is, I I lapsed into Bill Clinton here. Everybody in my class is treated the same way. Right, I don't, I don't, now you, now then they'll turn around and they'll say to me, you, however, Pesta, you're the only conservative in the entire humanities program, but you're brainwashing your kids. You know, (laughs) you're the one, Pesta, right? (sighs) <sighs> okay, well, speaking of all that we've just discussed, that's why we get on the Georgetown campus a professor who is a professor of law. He is a lawyer, a law professor named M. Greg Block. You get him saying, you know what, we need to ignore science when we decide which athletes actually get to be assigned to the men's or the women's athletic competitions. In an op-ed for The Hill, Block says, quote, we should recognize that in sports, as in the rest of life, we all have competitive edges and weaknesses, and that judgments about which are and aren't fair are matters of culture and politics, not biology. So let me play his game, the the Liz Warren game with him. Can you imagine if we applied that to affirmative action? Right? If he said, we should recognize that in sports, as in culture, as in the rest of life, we all have competitive uh, competitive edges, edges, we all have competitive edges and weaknesses, all right? What do you, you've just undercut all of your social justice theory, haven't you? You've just undercut all of your race baiting. How does this line up with white privilege, right? Whoa. It completely undercuts that, doesn't it? And so when it comes to his pet issue, allowing men with male bodies who think they're women to play women's sports, we have to stop asking those questions. There's where our social justice commitments to figuring out what genuinely happens go away. And he also goes on to say, we allow some differences in capability to affect sports outcomes without calling out those with an edge as cheaters. Indeed, we admire many of these advantages, whether we believe they're bestowed by God or good fortune. We praise competitors for their strength, speed, endurance, agility, toughness, discipline, resolve, and more. Speed, endurance, strength, agility, toughness, and now the fact that you decide to put a dress on. Right. The fact that you still have that male body, the fact that you could pretend all you want. Right. Well, how about this, Professor Block? How about gender and sex being one of those edges? Right. So in other words, you're born male for a reason and you're born female for a reason. But you can't let men be men and women be women. You have to pretend that that competitive edge, that's the one and only one you want to see covered up with. Right. Let because you have an ideology that drives your understanding. We saw Elizabeth Warren. 
uh, law professor at Harvard. We see this clown, law professor at Georgetown, a Catholic university, I might add to you. This is the, you, maybe we are focusing a little bit in the wrong way. We get that 95% of professors support Democrats over conservatives. But you look at the law profession. I would love to see somebody do this. What is the percentage of progressive lawyers, particularly teaching ones? I'll bet you that if it's 95 to 1 faculty-wide between conservatives and, and, and uh, um, liberals in terms of where they donate, I would bet if you surveyed prog- lib- uh, law school faculty across all the country, all the, the colleges in the country, you would find that number would be hideously higher. I think we sh- probably could find that information. I would out. bet you're talking 200 to 1. Whew, that would be a lot. All right. Well, we're going to move on because we need to take a look at a story we talked about last week involving Florida Common Core. What's happening over there? Yeah, last week I, I had kind of a, raps, a rhapsody of, of joy over what Fl- uh, Florida was doing. And I knew, look, the reason I was so um, giddy, <laughs> knowing full well that the standards hadn't quite been released. I mean, I knew for sure that when the standards were released to the public, there would be problems. And now that the standards have been released to the public, there are problems. There are vestiges of Common Core all throughout the new Florida standards. They haven't completely gotten rid of Common Core. Uh, Common Core methodology and approaches is still there. Uh, it's, it's more than I'd like to see. And I, I want to thank all the activists across the country. I've heard from four or five of them who, who showed and shared with me some of this information. And I'll give it to you in a moment. Why was I so so rhapsodizing about this because we've fought Common Core for nine years now, me and thousands of others. And I I can't think of almost a single battle we've won. Not a single state has rejected it. Not a single state really never, it's in all of the programs, right? All the textbooks have gone that way. The teachers have been trained in this ridiculous new ideology. It's been tough, right, for all of us who have fought this. And we've, other than tiny little battles, we've never won anything. So this, what, and looking at, at the, the standards now that they've been released, this is still a huge step in the right direction. There's no doubt that there are problems. I'll give you some of the problems that, uh, uh, that, that have been sent to me by others, and my, I looked at the standards myself. Um, you know, the part of the problem here is, is that you, you, you're, sl- the slow imp- you're, you're taking a long time to implement this, right? So it's a lot of, lot, lot of transfer over here. Uh, in terms of things like uh, the, the, the streamlining the testing is coming. Um, we need to see more uh, evidence about how they're going to integrate reading. We need to see more. I'd like to see much more uh, emphasis on phonics much younger. Uh, that's uh, one of the concerns about this. And with the math, too, still no, still no serious algebra by eighth grade. Still pushing algebra off into high school, uh, a math uh, curriculum that's going to guarantee that kids, if you're not taking algebra till you're freshman in high school, you're not getting to calculus, those kind of things. So this is a hugely flawed document. We knew it would be. The, the, government, uh, the governor of Florida, the Sanctus, didn't have carte blanche to simply order these things. And like with all of these types of things, there's a lot of negotiation. So um, I I urge you to take a look at the Florida standards yourself. I can send you a link if you want, but you can go to the Florida education website and see it. Uh, The reality is, is that, uh, that where were we a month ago? A month ago, we were in a situation where no one was even talking about Comic Core even though it's all three years. It's been rebranded. It's been renamed. It's been repackaged. We've got the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, who says we don't have to get rid of Common Core because it's already no longer existent, right? Betsy DeVos said that. We have a situation where moms and dads, many of whom fought this five and six and seven years ago, figure that it's over now because your state just simply renamed it. So again, for somebody who has worked as hard as we all have, to see this movement, to, to put the idea of Common Core back in the front burner, to demonstrate that Common Core is still here and needs to be removed, how the governor and all of the agencies been working with across the state make the effort to get this far, that is a huge thing, in spite of the fact that there are a lot about this, a lot of things about this that don't go far enough. This is a good day. It's a good thing that the governor did. It just again, if for no other reason, it's a reminder that this is stuff that has to be removed. It didn't just vanish when Obama ba- vanished, right? So in that sense, it's a good thing. But as always, do your due diligence. Check out the standards for yourself and do a little reading. And uh, th- this will give you a sense in other states. I hope it'll give other states, people in other states, uh, hope that they can begin to push this way too now that they not one state has tried to do it. All right, that will do it for this Monday show. Now, I know you're tired because it's the day after the Super Bowl, but I hope that you will be super awesome and share this video to help grow the show. Just click on that share button to tell all of your friends about the Dr. Duke Show. That's it. And then afterward, in the words of Staples, you can say, 
That was easy. And speaking of the Super Bowl, isn't it interesting that almost every commercial now is a social justice advertisement? So the, the, the NFL now is full in your face progressive. And all these corporations that people like Liz Warren and Bernie Sanders want to destroy because they're greedy, 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 they're already singing the tune of progressives. Amazing. But if you are a fan of the show and you have a business, consider partnering with us. We will never turn your advertisement into a social justice pandering event. Visit freedomproject.com slash advertise to learn more. Freedomproject.com slash advertise to learn more. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke, and she's Katie. Until next time, stay educated, my friends. <laughs>